So for this last learning module of chapter three, we'll look at equilibrium in three dimensions. So just like we did in two dimensions, let's kind of take motivation from a real world scenario. And I took actually this description along with the, the image from the uh, text slides. And uh, here, what we can see is we have this big electromagnet that's being used to lift uh, scrap from a heap. And again, we're asked the questions as engineers of whether or not the support structure for this electromagnet and whatever loads it may be picking from the scrap heap is sufficient, particularly R is kind of the structural integrity of those cables that we're using to attach the electromagnet to the supporting hook. Is it sufficient? So the one thing, the reason that I went into all that detail and said all those words again, is you might say, oh, you're just repeating the same thing that you did in two dimensions. And that's 100% true. These are the same types of problems. The only thing that is different is that the support structure uh, doesn't live, the associated forces with the support structure doesn't live in a two-dimensional or coplanar space. So the ideal is completely the same. It's just that we can't get away with modeling in two dimensions anymore because of the underlying geometry of the situation that we're trying to analyze. So uh, if we have to work in 3D, right, the math is going to be a bit more complicated. However, the kind of good news from a uh, statically determinate point of view is we will have an additional equilibrium equation, which will give us the capacity to solve for one more unknown. And I, I do want to emphasize that it's not like that additional equation pops out of thin air. The conditions for static equilibrium are still the same, namely the resultant force has to be zero. It's just that the resultant force has components in three dimensions that gives us three scalar equations. And that's all this is saying here. If you have a three-dimensional force, then in order for that resultant force to be zero, each of its components has to be zero, which gives us three scalar equations, which if they're linearly independent, we can use to solve for three different unknowns. And recall that those unknowns might represent the magnitudes of the forces, or they might be um, some additional parameter involved in describing their directions, or like the um, spring-based example that we worked, the magnitude of the forces may give us the capability to solve for some other parameter of interest like a, a spring displacement. So I think this is uh, very well emphasized by a problem. Assume that we have, uh, again, it's kind of the, the book in the statics of particles chapter tends to use the same type of examples because we need our support structure to yield a system of concurrent forces where all the lines of action go through the same point, which is going to let us simplify and uh, analyze our bodies as just particles. So that's why there's this common O connector that we have multiple support structures connected to. So imagine we have a 600 Newton load actually pulling the support, uh, pulling the connection point of the support structure down. And it is supported by three cables that are fastened here as we see at point D, C, and B. It's going to be the same idea that we've worked in every problem so far. We'll assume that the cables are in tension, which means that they're each going to pull on that center uh, connector at point A. And uh, the line of action or the direction of each of those forces is going to be parallel to or aligned on the direction of the cable itself. So um, given all of that information, say that we wanted to find the tension developed in chords A, B, A, C, and A, D. So the way that we're going to do that is the same way that we did for the two-dimensional case. Uh, again, we'll make a concurrent forces argument and analyze this as a particle. So what this really boils down to is just setting up the system of three equations uh, that we will need in order to solve for our unknowns and making sure that we do have only three unknowns that we're attempting to solve for. So let's go back to the actual geometry and try to solve this piece by piece. What do you notice about the physical arrangements of these three cables? Well, the first thing that you probably realize, again, assuming that cable AC is in tension, is that the force exerted by that cable on the connector at A is going to be totally directed along the negative X or negative I hat direction. In addition, notice that this uh, force exerted by the cable connected from A to B is going to live totally in the XY plane, meaning that it will only have an X and Y component. Specifically, it's going to pull forward in the X direction and to the right in the Y direction. Uh, cable uh, connected from A to D is the only cable that's arranged geometrically in such a way that it, it can actually oppose the loading force of 600 newtons. Uh, so it will have, in general, both an X, Y, and Z component. And it's always good in your head um, to kind of keep sanity checks in place and ask yourself, and, and part of the big challenge of uh, being good at this is being able to visualize the three-dimensional coordinates from the 2D drawing. So uh, let's make sure that we can do that to go from point A to D and X, we're going to have to move 
I should say an X rather, be careful with your coordinate systems. And again, just to, uh, to refresh, this is a right-handed coordinate system because if you place your base of your fingers along X and curl your hand towards Y, uh, your thumb points in the direction of the positive Z direction. So notice that in order to move from A to D, we need to come out in the X direction from the origin by a dimension that's labeled as one meters, so plus one in X. Uh, in Y, we need to go in the negative direction by two meters. And then once we get to that point in the XY plane, we need to go up by two meters. So hopefully when we um, will see that the way we describe this direction of this force is to use kind of those uh, position vectors and corresponding unit vector techniques. Ideally, we'll have the plus X, minus Y, and plus C uh, type uh, components. But let's uh, do the composition. So for B, we said that it lives totally in the XY plane. So we know that its K hat component should be zero. How can we resolve it into X and Y components? Well, notice that for the given geometry, if we kind of project the tip of vector B onto the Y axis, we form a right triangle, where in this case now, the X component is going to be opposite of that 30 degree angle. So that's why when B is decomposed, right, we'll take the magnitude of B and we'll multiply by the sine of 30 in order to get the X component. And we'll multiply by the cosine of 30 in order to get the Y component. And in both cases, since those are aligned in the positive X and Y directions, we don't need to do any sign adjustments. But key point that I want to emphasize there is it's not always the fact that the X component is the cosine and the Y component is the sine. It all depends on the particular uh, geometrical information that you're given. Fortunately for FC, since it's purely along the X axis, as we mentioned in the last slide, we don't have to do any decomposition there. We know that whatever that tension is, it's all going to, in a vector representation, be in the X component. And we do note that if positive X is coming out of the plane, then FC is uh, going to be negative by convention. In order to kind of describe the direction of force D, we'll kind of do that concept I was talking about on the previous slide, where we read out the coordinate locations in the given X, Y, and Z coordinate system for point D. We said again, just to refresh, that at a positive X come out by one out of the plane, go from there to the left by two units. And since the left is denoted as um, negative, it will be negative two. And once you're there in the XY plane, go up two units. So that's how I'm getting the uh, coordinate triplet for point D as one minus two, two. Recall if you wanna form a position vector from the origin to point D, you take the coordinates of D and subtract away the coordinates of O on a kind of coordinate by coordinate basis. Since O is your origin, that just turns out to be the coordinates of D written as a vector. And uh, you can make that into a unit vector by taking it and scaling it by its magnitude. For any vector, you can always get the magnitude is taking the square root of the sum of the squares of each component. So fortunately, again, we get a perfect square there and this comes out a little bit easy. And uh, so we don't know the magnitude of FD. However, we do know that it kind of decomposes in the X, Y, and Z plane by multiplying by this unit factor. So believe it or not, and uh, in addition, maybe the one thing I should have shown on here is the actual load, the 600 Newton load is directed purely in the minus Z or minus K hat direction. So if we look at the three support vector forces here, here, and here, we'll notice that really we just have three unknowns. So we are by the um, scalar conditions of equilibrium, which say that the sum of all forces in the X, Y, and Z direction must be zero, going to be able to solve for what we need. Now, the key point in being good at these kind of problems, uh, in addition to being able to read out the geometry that you're given, is to be careful in your bookkeeping and um, make sure that you're not mixing up components as you go from step to step. So uh, we're just copying each of these from the previous slide. And all that we um, need to enforce now is that the sum of all forces in the X direction need to be zero, do the same thing for the Y and do the same thing for the Z. And if you notice what you get here is a three by three linear system. As I mentioned in the previous two dimensional module, module, oftentimes if the equations are tightly coupled, it's good to use matrix based techniques here. However, you can probably visually see that these are kind of iteratively decoupled, meaning by uh, kind of physically what's going on is we know D, the cable from A to D, is the only cable that can pull up. So naturally, we're going to be able to determine the tension in that cable just by enforcing vertical equilibrium. Once we have the tension in that cable, we'll be able to, as we'll see mathematically, kind of iteratively go through and do uh, substitution. So you can use matrix algebra techniques for here, but it's unnecessary.
We'll get FD from sum of Z equation. From that, we'll get FB from the sum of Y equations. And from that, we'll be able to get the remaining unknown, which uh, was FC. So that's all that this uh, next slide is showing is you can solve those iteratively and get the three unknowns that you want. Again, I do want to emphasize you could have used a linear algebra approach here. It's just uh, probably, I mean, I guess it depends on how good you are at entering uh, matrix vector equations into your calculator. So feel free to solve these equations however you like. And if you need another review on how to use um, matrix vector uh, based techniques or if for your technology that you're using, you'd like um, kind of me to walk you, walk you through of how to do it, I'm happy to do that.